Hi, I'm Derek. And I'm Vincent. I have one very specific goal today, and that's to convince you that eigenvalues and vectors are the bee's knees. First, let's start off with a little background. The words eigenvalue and eigenvector obviously have something in common, and that's the word eigen. Turns out that it's German, and it loosely translates to proper or characteristic. Why is this important? Well, eigenvalues and eigenvectors happen to be pretty darn good at modeling several real-world phenomena. We'll show you in a second. But first, how do you find them? Let's say you have a transformation. Like Optimus Prime? No, a linear transformation. Some matrix that, when multiplied by a vector, gives you another vector in the same space, usually pointing in a different direction than the original. That's cool, I guess. <laughs> Just wait for it. If you assume the actual transformation matrix is unknown, then you can say the transformed vector is simply a sub x. Furthermore, if y is any possible vector formed by multiplying the transformation matrix with x, then you can say that a scalar multiple of x is also a solution to the equation. Let's focus on those. I still don't understand. Wait, so if y equals lambda x, where x is the original vector, then you could say the transformation matrix times x equals lambda x, meaning lambda is some scalar. This is called the characteristic equation, where x is the eigenvalue, eigenvector, and lambda is the eigenvalue. You find out pretty quickly what you're essentially doing with any x when you find the eigenvector and value is you're essentially mapping an axis made by the linear transformation. The eigenvalue scales x up and down this axis and can effectively model some pretty useful stuff, such as the rising and falling of predator populations with respect to their prey, and even the structural stability of bridges. This all sounds boring. How does this even relate to my life? If only you knew. Eigenvectors and values have plenty of real-world applications, including one that's so common you never even knew it. As a matter of fact, you've alone probably have inadvertently created thousands of eigenvectors without even knowing it. Yeah, right. <laughs> As it were, you probably got to this video through an eigenvector. You still don't get it? It's Google. Easily the biggest proponent of the eigenvector, Google bases their entire search legacy on the back of the eigen. That's awesome. <laughs> I know, right? That was sarcasm. I still don't know what it does. <laughs> Why you gotta be like that? Okay, fine, I'll explain. But we've gotta go back. You likely know how the internet works. A person makes a web page, then has it hosted on a server under a global URL so that anyone can access the web page anytime. These servers are networked together so that anyone from another server can access that web page with the right permissions. With a, couple of web with a couple of websites, it'd be easy to find one, assuming they're archived somewhere. You just perform a linear search, go one by one until you find the website, and enjoy. But what happens when the web page count approaches real life values? There's an estimated 25 billion websites on the internet, and with 10,000 words each on average, it means 10 to, <sighs> 10 to the n power times 10 to the fourth power words to, surf, to sift through. For every search, if you attempted to search one by one for a specific document through the list, you'd never finish, since the internet is expanding faster than you can sift through the knowledge it contains. So, how can you make it go faster? <laughs> well, if you rank the pages based on how often they're used or cited, uh, let's call this the page rank. Google won't tell us the actual formula they use for the page rank, because they don't want people tinkering with the system. But let's just get as close to the model as possible. Let's denote the importance as L p sub i. Now, let's say some web page p sub i has L sub i links. Let's also say that another page p sub j gets 1 over i sub j importance or recognition just because they're on this page. This means that the total importance of p sub j will be the summation of 1 over the number of links that a page has that links to it across the span of all available web pages brought up by your search. Wait. How can you find the importance of a web page before you know the importance of the other web pages? What, what came first, the chicken or the egg? Well, it's simple. The web sorts itself out. We'll create a set B sub i, which contains all the pages linking to P sub i. And we'll create two matrices. One matrix is H, for which every entry in the ith row and jth column is 1 over i sub j, or 0 if page j is not in the P sub i and therefore not in P sub, er, B sub i. Note that all the entries are non-negative, and the entries in each column add up to 1. This is called a probability vector. Without going into too much detail, we basically have a guaranteed eigenvalue of 1. 
The other matrix is called I, and it's going to contain the final page ranks for the web, web pages that we've monitored. So let's say we have eight web pages arranged like so, the arrows representing links to those websites. I'll keep you away from the heavy math for the sake of concept, but here's what H would look like. Remember, H is the probability that a page that you're willing to link, ah, that the page you're on will link you to a certain other page. With an eigenvalue of one, you can solve the characteristic equation I equals H sub I for one, which effectively ranks the web pages relative to each other based on the number of times they've been linked. The beauty of this is the web pages essentially rank themselves ahead of time, and Google has a very powerful way, a very fast way to calculate the page ranks almost instantaneously, resulting in an unbiased peer search result. Wow, that is pretty cool. I told you. Thanks for watching.